Every weekend, you will find me on my couch watching a particular channel that's always talking about homes and gardens. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. oh, yeah. I won't say the channel just in case it's like a conflict. But um, we always hear this thing of people talking about a house has good bones, right? Right. And <laughs> this idea that if something was built a long time ago, it's much better than the things that are built now. Yesterday, we started talking about, you know, the difference between good architecture and good urban planning. And I wanted to just kind of continue that thread a little bit. Uh, Carol, what's more important, form or function of a design? Oh. It has to be a dialogue between the two. Um, is, this a I, control, is this a controversial thing to say or? Uh, no, I don't think it's controversial. Yeah. I, think, I think it's perhaps controversial if we talk about um, something we talked about before, which is sort of the commodification of, 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 of our buildings. And so there is a big period when, uh, when we talked about just iconic buildings and, and that was what the project had to be. It had to be, it had to be remarkable. It had to be, it had to be a feat of engineering. And, 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 and really, I think you, you can't talk about that without talking about the space that you're creating mm -hmm. within that. So the dialogue between the function of the space, we can't talk about how, space mattering and, and not referring to the function. Um, and the, the shaping of that space comes from, comes from the form. Mm -hmm. And we talked uh, as well about uh, the public realm and the impact that buildings have on the air around them and the space around them and the street around them. And so the, the form of that building ha starts to inflect the public realm. So I think that it has to be a dialogue between what the form of a building, what it looks like, what it says, what the face, literal facade is the face, what, what is that communicating uh, and the threshold to the public realm uh, is, is part of that dialogue between the function, housing the functionality um, of, that, of that building and its purpose uh, to serve its community, uh, but also what, what that form does to the corollary space outside. I'd love so, to hear, oh, sorry. Yeah, so it's a dialogue. It's a dialogue. Yeah. I'd love to hear uh, your, the thoughts from everybody else. Uh, Don, is it form function, function? definitely over yeah. form. Um, um, you know, when I think of the Royal Ontario Museum, the, the new edition that represents a kind of significant problem in my view in architecture. What is that? Um, because the architect began with a sculpt, you know, a sculptural proposal that has no regard for what's exhibited on the interior, and you know, it's it's actually a kind of really problematic in terms of 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 the kind of role of the museum in society as a kind of place to engage with. Uh, you know, with history and storytelling and artifacts is negated by the interior of that building. Mm -hmm. The kind of public process of moving through the building, in my view, is problematic. And it was, it, you know, the imposition of a form, an abstraction that's disconnected from what the building is about, but also disconnected from the public realm. Mm -hmm. Because architecture um, um, is, you know, the making of buildings is, is what we're all involved in, but the making of space between buildings to create the public realm is very much what we're involved in, mm -hmm. and you can't turn your back on the reciprocity between those two things. Is that why you say it's an imposition? It's an imposition in that it's, there's a kind of hostility with the way that building deals with the public realm. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in a climate of ice and snow. The ice and snow cascades down that building onto people who are walking by. Mm -hmm. You know, it, there's just kind of, it's, it's, I think, problematic in its preoccupation with form in the first instance. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an, it's, I'm using it just as a kind of way of illustrating the point. But, but that sense of, of um, shaping the public realm is, is, is just as important. And I think it's another area where architects haven't been as good as, they, as we should be mm. in really understanding that, you know, whether it's um, uh, community space, whether it's um, garden space, whether it's park space, recreation space, or the kind of street, the place of gathering and meeting and connecting with one another as a community, those spaces are just as important. And each building in a certain way contributes to that relationship um, um, in an urban setting, in a, in a more, um, a less dense setting, the relationship between building and landscape is of critical importance, as others have mentioned, but, but definitely function. It's really interesting. But I think that that's, uh, that's why I mentioned it's a dialogue, because right. you can't ignore the form. Exactly. I think that 
the debt, if we define form as being, uh, we have to make something exciting, then, then it absolutely follows the function. Um, it should not be the thing that trumps the functionality. But I believe that it is a dialogue between the shaping of that public realm. So you cannot, you cannot ignore it. It's a dialogue between the two. In mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not inconceivable to get everything in balance. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story about a, a, a competition we went into where the president of Boston University asked for an iconic building. Now, we're Canadian. We don't really <laughs> respond to that. So we think, well, why does he want an iconic building? Because Boston University is 1.5 miles along Commonwealth Avenue. There's not a building of distinction. There's a little cert building, which is about you know, 10 stories. And then right across the river is MIT. And so this was, this was the president's way of actually creating a form that would uh, speak to MIT and to have a program uh, for data and computer sciences that would be uh, a co competitor, if not a, if not a, um, the kind of um, the best faculty in the United States would be housed in this iconic building. And so he gave it to us as architects. But as you say, the, the public realm is very important. The base of the building, mm -hmm. how it interacts. So you know how you display, how you uh, locate the functionality, the student-related spaces, the classrooms, the teaching spaces, and how this tower goes up is very, uh, I, w I don't need to describe it to you because the next time you're in Boston, you'll actually see it from anywhere because we actually drove our camera all around the city in a 3D model to see if you could see, he said, can you see it from here? Can you see it from here? <laughs> you could see it from everywhere because there's nothing else on that street. <laughs> so anywhere you can see. So I think you know we say form follows function, but in, in you know very often you need the f you need the form you need the form to actually excite to attract. It is part of the magnetism of the building and getting it right within its context and also public realm, and that the functionality that you create environments in which researchers can can actually create neighborhoods and can walk all the way up the building because there's an open stair that runs through and the building actually shifts around that stair. So your relationship to the typical floor plate, which is typical usually in this case because the building's moving around that staircase, you're getting different environments. So it was it was a really challenging, um, but I think as it was competition with you know the best US architects and the moment the president saw it he said he recognized iconic right. so, mm. challenge. What about you Aladia? Former function. So I'm thinking of this little utilitarian building uh, that won a Toronto Urban Design Award. Uh, it's a water processing mm. facility, mm. right? Mm. The one, the little angular one. And uh, it's sad to me that architects have relinquished such a big part of the building you know, undertaking a marketplace because, uh, you know, when you get an architect that, that has uh, sensitivity involved, even in a little water treatment plant, you get this wonderful little gem-like structure and it's so beautiful to see. It's like in this very out of the way place. It's not in a beautiful site or anything, but it's just lovely. And yeah. it, it brings delight, you know, yeah. and attention to something that might not get much attention. Uh, so like form and function are, intrinsically linked. So if you look at like one of my favorite architectural typologies, which is the Plains teepee, uh, you know, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, mm -hmm. and uh, Plains Cree sort of use this structure and it's been refined over the course of many millennia uh, to be absolutely efficient mm -hmm. in every way and really suited to its environment so much so that even Anishinaabek Nation around the Great Lakes use it uh, because it's just so good. Um, and so it's like a, it expresses the tensile forces with the originally buffalo hide, now often canvas skin. Uh, it's laid in an egg shape uh, so that it uh, takes the prevailing winds on the uh, sort of tapered end. It looks like a circle, but it's actually ever so slightly egg shaped and plan. Mm -hmm. And then you have these poles that are very easy to transport. You can stick them on a pickup truck or back in the day, a horse or even back back in the day, a you know, dog team. And, um, you know, uh, very portable. Uh, and it, um, it can be hitched up like skirts in the summertime to take the breezes and just become a shade structure. It can be uh, tamped down in the winter uh, with a dew cloth and insulation layer. Um, it can be, you can heap snow up on the, on the sides of it to insulate it even further. And it's just so suited to its function, to its environment. It uses easily uh, renewable resources, very low impact. 
uh, in all of the embodied energy it, mm -hmm. it represents. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, it's ephemeral. So if you are done with the components of that TB, you can just let give it back to the uh, mm -hmm. places it came from and it right away reintegrates into the environment. So The thought process of that design is just like kind of blows your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to kind of take this opportunity to kind of, you know, give you a chance to spill your secrets. <laughs> If you're willing, <laughs> um, what goes? What is your process uh, like when you're thinking of a design, Don? You know, it's the. I mean, Aladi was talking about the the kind of Lakota TP structure, and in a way, it defines this sort of extraordinary balance between mm -hmm. a form um, and a, a strong environmental response, a kind of light, minimal energy that is, is uh, expended in making it. it. There's that sort of perfection of, or, or ba an incredible balance um, between uh, elements um, on many levels. And I think, you know, the process of design is a, is, um, a, a kind of fairly patient, uh, uh, exploration and investigation uh, that involves research, it involves listening to your client. Do you ever get like something like writer's block? Where I don't, not... luckily. Yeah. John's like, no, not me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're working um, now on a new wing of the Art Gallery of Ontario. It's roughly the size of all the exhibition space at, mm. the, at the Whitney Museum in New York. And mm. It's devoted to global contemporary work, in other words, work from indigenous people across the, uh, the, this country and, and the continent, the diasporas in Africa, Southeast Asia, Asia. Um, and so the, the kind of process of listening and conversation, at the same time, it's, it's inserted into this very kind of um, leftover odd service space on this amazing campus of the Art Gallery of Ontario, which is an entire city block. And it has to rise seven stories in order to accommodate the program. But the whole process of, of over months discovering where do you connect it into this, uh, the existing circumstance of the gallery? How can you solve the problems of dead ends in public circulation that the gallery has now? How can, we've designed it all from the inside out. Um, and and it's been a kind of very patient discovery, and finally we pop out back to the exterior, and there's a kind of form that has emerged, a bit um, shaped um, by the cardinal points, mm -hmm. um, working with um, uh, Brian Porter, a fantastic Indigenous architect who's mm -hmm. been a joy to collaborate with, you know, finding the points of view out of this largely exhibition space to the east, to the west, north and south, um, to the sky, um, to the ground. How can we make outdoor sculpture terraces that relate to uh, Grange Park? And how can we clad it in a clay that is glazed, that is, you know, Ontario, Toronto clay, mm -hmm catching light from the sky, changing its its luminosity. And, and finally, you emerge with this sort of really totemic or sculptural presence. It has a very powerful sculptural form and identity that is separate from, you know, the art gallery of, of Ontario's Gary Wing, the kind of blue titanium and, and Will Allsop's um, OCAD building, very iconic buildings on either side. We're kind of in the middle, but but it's a sort of patient process of, of exploration and discovery and editing and curating the process and something great emerges. And again, so many different layers. Uh, Carol, what's your design process like? Our process, my process starts with walking the site. Um, I think that- You do that way? Because experiencing a place is, has got to be at the root of everything we do uh, mm -hmm. and trying to understand it and trying to distill a project down to our common experiences. So I think that uh, that when you walk the site and you observe it and you spend time, you know, perhaps you talk to the people from a community that have nothing to do with the project. Right. You see where they eat. Mm. <laughs> you see how they you see how they they use their city. You see how they use their town. You see how they use their site. Um, you know, a lady and I are actually working on a project together where I don't think we could have started that project any other way. But, you know, you, walking the site is, 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 is really starts to connect you deeply mm -hmm. and brings 
to the fore the responsibility you have as a, of a, as a designer that you are going to be impacting this place. Mm. Um, so it starts with that. And I think we also spend a lot of time doing, uh, and Don mentioned research. So our research gets a little bit deep. We end up doing like, uh, where, when, when we dig in, we start looking at the paleo history of land. Really? And all of a sudden you start to understand the, the knock-on impact of where you are. Uh, sometimes you're working at a, 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 on a project, say, at the waterfront of Toronto, but if you don't look at our ravine systems, if you don't look at the moraine, if you don't understand the watershed of Toronto, then you don't understand being on the shore. And so you start to look... You, we like to take the, the, the mile high, not even the mile high, but the 20,000 uh, perspective and then come back in and, and then understand the history of the land and the people who were there. So you understand how a place was settled, you understand where a grid came from, you understand all of that. And we do this almost with every project. And then we get very specific uh, with respect to the communities we're working with. Uh, we're, we're doing a building for mathematicians at the University of, 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 of Waterloo. And talking to them about math is amazing. And then you start to pull these threads of understanding how you understand what matters to them and how you can reflect that in how you start to look at architecture. And I think in that way, you start to build buildings that mean something to communities. Um, and if you do that with every aspect of what you're doing, including the material choices that you're working with for projects, and to touch briefly on something we talked about before, form and function, I love that you were talking about the functionality of materials what they want to do and how you use those materials uh, to, in a way that is, is conducive to what those materials want to do. And I think that for us um, and for myself, the process is trying to be very, very genuine and very, very specific uh, on each of the projects. And that starts with walking the site. Carol, what you just said is so fascinating because I don't think a lot of people have the insights that go behind like the minds of architects when you're make when you're making all these decisions. So that was like I, I'm so glad that you're all sitting at this table because I'm learning so much. But Marianne, what is your design process? Well I, I think it is similar in terms of research and understanding the context of where you are is, is hugely important. And you do learn it from the guy who's repairing the fountain on the on the site to the people that want to show you the site because they want their building built. So there's that real kind of range of stakeholders. And I would say um, a lot of uh, to take to add to that is program. You know, you're given a program, a number of spaces that have a square footage that add up to a certain uh, gross square footage and that aligns with the budget. And I think one of the most fascinating things is to be sure that those programmatic components are what they really need and that they make sense and that they will have the full utilization that the client anticipates and whether you can have flexibility in a building and whether you can add something that is kind of the inspiration or the glue, those spaces that are really not in the program, that are often in the, in the movement systems widening a corridor so you can put a high top table in it and kids can stand at it before they go into class or that you've accommodated the numbers of people that are going to go in so it's a kind of programmatic invention mm -hmm. so it really is about it's yeah. about local research it's about site it's about program and then it is you know also being sure that you can align with the expectations in terms of budget that you can actually get the building built it's only happened once but i have had a building that was doubled the price and wasn't, you know, was, and, and it didn't go forward. But other times, I think we're in a time where you really, um, prices are changing so quickly, the cost of buildings. So it's, it's a balance of those three things and it's, it's iterative. And I think as, you know, as our voices mature within the profession, I think we have a lot of authority to, to, to be trusted to manage all of those aspects. You know, and do you, you, do you also think, sorry, do you also think about how people are going to experience that space? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you, that's, I mean, we have <laughs> the ability core. now through, <laughs> yeah. through, um, I mean, historically it was more all in your head. It's still all in my head, but we have the tools to actually explore three-dimensionally to use mm. 2D uh, exploration, to use computers to explore spaces and to run videos and cameras through the way someone would experience so in, 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 a, in a project I'm doing at, at Yale, it is more about um, selling the, the, the movement spaces, the spaces where students and faculty will gather, 
we're, we're taking um, students and faculty from a very dispersed uh, drama school and into one building and to actually explain to them how they say, well, we don't work that way. I said, well, you don't know how you work because you've worked in 12 buildings on the campus. But what if you could do this? What if you could do that? And showing those spaces. The program blocks are the program blocks, but it is the program invention that comes through in the social aspects. And so when I say buildings are for people, it is for, and if this, people, this building isn't embraced by the people who use it, then you know that the success will be in that. So I think you really need to you need to keep going back to the stakeholders and talking to them, and get a real sense. Eladia, what about you? Because uh, I think sometimes people think that when you come up with these ideas, you're like, you know, writing it or drawing it on the back of a napkin, or you know, what is your design <laughs> process? Uh, we start with step zero, which is who speaks for the territory. Uh, so um, we figure out. Uh, you know, which, uh, which indigenous nation occupies this land, uh, what's happened since, um, who needs to come to the table to uh, inform us about the, the key project success factors, which I, I always say are uh, so important. Um, we view our, our design role as an architect as Ashkabewis. Mm -hmm. So this is a concept sh uh, shared with me by Michael Lavager, who's uh, an Anishinaabe uh, licensed architect working out of Minnesota. And that's sort of the role of helper or messenger, where we mm. bring the intention of the community and uh, manifest that into a physical form using all the tools at our disposal. So uh, we come up with really good questions in coordination with uh, participant leaders mm -hmm. uh, so that we are crafting those questions together. And then we figure out what best tools to use to ask those questions to the right people. Uh, then we listen to the answers and all importantly, summarize uh, in a really straightforward way, validate those results back with the participant leaders and implement. And that is the key that often gets missed is implementation. Because if you ask a whole bunch of good questions and you listen to the answers and then you just kind of ignore them, uh, you're in a really bad spot where your engagement activity has been has completely lost its integrity right so we really have to focus on implementing the answers mm -hmm. so i think um when we come back to uh participant leaders again and um show them the concept work that we've come up with based on their insights uh they almost always uh have a almost visceral response that this is this is right you know and if we're not getting there we have to go back and do some work together to to get to that spot, spot where it's like, yes, this is right for us. Uh, and that concept design, that um, uh, summary of uh, results that we that we heard uh, from the participant group guides the process right through to the end. So we always touch back on that at every phase of refinement to make sure that we're still right there with them, and that we're working together, and that we are being the messengers of their of their priorities, their value systems, their activities that they want to welcome into the space. And then that is what ends up happening for them because then it became, becomes this vibrant place of, of activity and life and, uh, and people feel like they are part of it, that it's theirs. Uh, and that, that it belongs is, to them. Yeah. That it belongs to them. Yeah. We have about five minutes left, but I wanted to talk about materials and the, the process you go into deciding which materials you use. Uh, Don, you propose to use Ontario limestone for the Ottawa Public Library project. How come? Because the, um, that library project sits on um, a piece of geology and topography, which is very much um, part of the kind of landscape. You know, Parliament Hill that we were talking about earlier sits on this extraordinary escarpment. So the Library of Parliament and, and the center block and east and, and west blocks have this amazing escarpment um, an architecture shaped to the escarpment and an architecture that through the rivers connects across the province and across the nation. And that same escarpment continues mm -hmm. um, through our site, which is just to the west of Parliament. <clears throat> and so um, uh, embedding a kind of natural forms and natural systems that have to do with the place that uh, the genus loci, as Carol was talking about earlier, um, really, um, was a way of locating that building in both mm -hmm. the landscape and the geology, but the architectural traditions mm -hmm. and histories in Ottawa. And Carol, you said you prefer timber. How come? 
<laughs> That's an interesting uh, um, topic for me. Yeah. For the last uh, six years or so, I've been uh, really um, embedded in a couple of significant projects that are using um, timber uh, for the structure. And um, I, I definitely believe in making, you choosing the right material for the right purpose and, and the context is really important. But currently I don't think that we can look at any material selections without really, really deeply understanding their impact to the environment. And currently um, timber for the structure of buildings is, is really tied to both management of our forests and we see that our entire country seems to be on fire right now and, and I think forestry management is a huge part of that um, and part of that is, the, is, is, is getting industry in, into the forest so that we can actually take care of them as well as look at a resource that we can use in a renewable way. How do you do that? Because I know that there's a conversation. We are uh, there's a lot of things happening in this country right now. Climate change is at the top of people's minds. Mm -hmm. When you say timber, you know, even the, gov the federal government has a plan to build uh, several billions of right. trees within a certain yeah. time. But you're saying that timber is the way to go. Timber it can be part of the solution. So first of all, the deforestation uh, across Canada is largely uh, for industries that don't replant. So industries like mining and agriculture that replace the forest. But if you're using it as, a, as and respecting it as a material that you need uh, for your mm -hmm. structures, you, you then have the ability to replant and to manage that forest and actually take care of it as you would take care of anything that you are dependent on, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think this isn't a replacement. This isn't an exploitation and an eradication uh, possibility. This is more about a long-term resilient uh, and regenerative approach to using a material that can be renewed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, right now, this has been a lot of my focus right now is to understand how we can use timber, a renewable resource for the structures of our buildings. And to think about it in terms of uh, understanding how that could also help us create a sense of identity across the country. I mean, the forests are different. The forest, the Douglas fir that comes from BC and, 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 and the black spruce in, in Quebec. Mm -hmm. And so if this starts to imbue our buildings, that sense of identity, a sense of place, sense of community is actually there in the materials that we can use in, in the various parts of our, our country. And I think that that actually gives us an interesting opportunity to create that sense of identity across the country as well, while looking at solutions for low carbon, embodied carbon solutions. And I'll just touch on that briefly because maybe not, not everyone knows. Um, so trees embody carbon. Mm -hmm. They breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen and retain the, the carbon for fiber. Mm -hmm. And so when you harvest a tree and then protect it and use it for means that we need anyway, mm -hmm. You've then preserved that carbon in the form of a building. You've not created a new carbon emergency by using other materials that are more carbon intensive. Mm -hmm. And you've created room in the forest to replant. And so that's the cyclical conversation we need to have with all the materials we use. Um, this is a good place mm -hmm. to leave it because tomorrow we're going to be talking about how we should experience space. Again, thank you so much for your time. This has been fascinating. Thank you. Our guests all this week are Eladia Smoke, Gay Shigaba Week, Principal Architect of Smoke Architecture. Carol Phillips, Design Leader and Partner at Moriyama Tashima Architects. Marianne McKenna, Founding Partner of KPMB Architects. And Don Schmidt, Principal of Diamond Schmidt Architects. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.